Please welcome to the stage Edward Snowden, President of the Freedom of the Press Foundation, and Marder Bletcher, Special Counsel to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Hi, uh, I'm Marta Belcher. I'm the General Counsel of Protocol Labs, uh, Board Chair of the Filecoin Foundation, and Special Counsel to EFF. And perhaps more to the point, I am one of the millions of people around the world who was blown away by Edward Snowden's disclosures in 2013 that revealed the extent of the US government's warrantless mass surveillance programs. I am so honored and excited uh, to be here with you today. Uh, so thanks so much for joining us, Edward. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, I want to rewind for a second to 2013. In 2021, it's almost trite to say that we experienced so much of our lives through a handful of corporations. And people and regulators all over the world are now thinking about what it means for those corporations to be fallible. So it's hard to remember that back in 2013, no one was really talking about this. It wasn't until your revelations that we really came to understand that what we do on private websites is often used in nefarious ways, including being handed over to the government without a warrant at a mass scale. So could you talk a little bit about the world in 2013, the world in 2021, and, and what's changed? Yeah, I mean, if you think about the people who are really worried about uh corporate nefariousness as it related to the internet, as it related to software, as it related to uh, the sort of trade and they could see how they could use their position. Um, they existed, uh, but it was like the Free Software Foundation, right? It was like the Linux Foundation. It was um, groups that were uh, white-minded. They could see what was technically possible uh, and they inferred from that uh, what could be happening. But the media, politicians, right, uh, sort of the expert class uh, that is involved in public communication. Uh, well, they're not comfortable uh, going based on inference uh, when it's a criticism of the system. Uh, and so much of that, that didn't get talked about. Well, now uh, it's no longer inference, right? We have documented proof. And in a democracy uh, where <laughs> theoretically, uh, it is the people who are supposed to direct the government, elect the government, you know, and say, these are the things that matter. These are the issues um, that should be addressed. Uh, we can never meaningfully uh, shift our focus and shift our policies unless we can first come to an agreement. There is a problem. And we can't agree that there is a problem unless we agree on what the facts are. And if those facts are in contention, they are not documented, they are not proven, you can never sort of establish that consensus. Uh, well, now in 2021, that consensus is well founded. Everybody knows there's a problem when you talk about uh, digital surveillance, when we talk about offline surveillance, right? when we talk about the hyper local surveillance, when we talk about license plate readers, when we talk about ring door cameras, you know, being uh, fed into police stations around the country. Thanks, Amazon. When we talk about Amazon Web Services, uh, when we talk about how Amazon is taking your uh, order flow and then they're sending that on to their own guys to compete uh, or create competing products uh, to people who are selling things on their stores, um, to Facebook, to Instagram, right? To the endless uh, scroll on your phone that's making a more and more of a comprehensive dossier of your interests, of your activities, of where you were, at what time, what you were reading, at what time, who you were speaking at what time. Um, people realize that Pandora's box is real um, and it is opening, right? And all of the evils that were contained in this box uh, are starting to escape into the atmosphere. And our job as technologists, um, I think, of those who have any kind of interest in this, who those people who are engaged in uh, sort of positive uses of technology that disrupt those systems of control, uh, we need to make sure that that hope remains in the box, right? The, the hope is the last thing that will come out uh, that will allow us to get away from that. Uh, just when I think about uh, what happened between 2013 and 2021 from a person sitting behind the desk at the NSA, uh, 
2013 felt pretty hopeless. Um, nobody understood what was going on. The uh, extent of surveillance was expanding every year. Our sophistication, our capability uh, was really by orders of magnitude advancing. And meanwhile, uh, just basic encryption to websites uh, was not happening on a regular basis. I just heard from my BFF staffer yesterday, Alexis, that she pulled the most recent statistics. And now, uh, at least in some browsers, uh, the amount of HTTPS traffic is 95% in 2021. That is night and day. It's not enough. It's not all the way there. That's only in browsers. That's only in some contexts. Uh, but the idea that many surveillance uh, was easy and cheap, it was frankly a uh, costless, and this is all of our communications getting snatched off the wires just as it transits the global internet. Now those are being closed. Now they're being armored. Now they're being protected. Uh, 2021 is just the beginning of a wave or, or the consequences of public awareness to the fact that the danger is here. And so you've talked a little bit about how the internet has improved over, over the last decade. Um, but the internet, of course, has also changed in a lot of ways that are are maybe not as positive. Um, so could you talk <laughs> right? So could you talk a little bit about how the internet today is different than what we thought it would be early on? Um, what's wrong with it, and and how we fix it? So one of the things that's a little bit uh, challenging for anybody who's you know a little bit older, and it, it's funny referring to myself a little bit older because I always used to be the youngest guy in the room. Um, and now that's no one. But uh, people who used the internet, the, the user class of the internet, um, in earlier iterations had a larger technical burden. Right? It's harder to use the internet. You, know, you had different devices, you had different software, like if you wanted to do anything useful, like, you know, get out of like sort of the AOL, the CompuServe model of the internet. Uh, you had to understand like what a news group is, or, you know, a modem is how you dial up to different bulletin boards and things like that. Now, now people buy an iPhone, right? Uh, or they buy a Samsung Galaxy or something like that. Uh, internet is just the Facebook app button. Uh, really terrible, terrible terms like that. They're not universally true. And I think for this only some, they, they don't hold largely true. Uh, but when we think about the absolute standard, what has happened is as technology has penetrated further and further into people's lives, um, they are less willing at scale to assume uh, that uh, technical burden, right? A burden of knowledge in order to interact with these systems. And so the winners have been the people who make it easy, who have made it uh, approachable, who have made it, by their terms, frictionless, right? But a lot of these frictionless systems, uh, all that really meant, because the cost is still there, the cost has to be borne by someone, right? is that the costs were hidden, right? The costs were backloaded. Um, the cost was you, so the story of your life, all of your activities, all of your movements, all of your associations, the social graph, how you spend, what you read, what you like, who you like. Um, and uh, what they do is they front load the joy, right? Uh, and they do all of this by, you know, you know, as, as sort of an EFF lawyer, uh, they put up these terms of service, right? This end user licensing agreement, this click OK to continue. Um, and there's been all kinds of studies that, that show, you know, even if people wanted to read that, uh, you have more eulas to read in a year than you have time in order to read them. Um, and even if you did, they always say, and like the first terms is that these are subject to change at any time and without notice, right? And they do change uh, frequently without notice. So we have, uh, again, what's changed not for the better in the end is we, the legal system that regulates these companies in you know the meat space is founded on the idea that we have all agreed to this. We have all consented to these terms, but we haven't even read the terms. And if we wanted to read the terms, you know, they're not material, they don't uh, last, uh, they're, they're sort of ephemeral. Um, it is all a masquerade. And this means that we are controlled in large part or influenced at least in large part by systems that we do not agree to uh, 
and we do not understand. That is the illusion of consent has replaced the fact of consent and the law has not yet realized uh, or recognized that there is a distinction. So I want to dive into how cryptocurrency plays into all of this. So for me, and I imagine for you, uh, the most important thing about cryptocurrency from a civil liberties perspective is that it can take the anonymity of cash and import it into the online world. And I have been very alarmed uh, in the last year that governments have been increasingly pushing to extend the mass surveillance of the traditional banking system onto cryptocurrency. So for example, the travel rule or the DOJ's crypto enforcement framework or the FinCEN and data proposals. And we've seen exchanges mysteriously delisting privacy coins as well. Mm -hmm. And what are your thoughts on that? And, and what do we do about it? Yeah, I mean, there, there, there's a lot here. Um, it all comes back to that fundamental concept that surveillance has become easier. The barriers to performing surveillance at scale uh, have given with the advance of technology. Um, we actually still believe things like the idea that cash is anonymous. Um, and that's no longer actually true. Uh, fun little exercise for anybody at home uh, who's doing this. Uh, you know those cash counters that you see at like the bank, you know, they, they can put like a stack of money in, it's like, Durr! and it uh, pulls it through and it says, these are, you know, of these bills or these are 30 of these bills, whatever. Like you can sort it and do all kinds of things. Uh, if you make a deposit, if you ever actually go into a bank anymore, which in the life you don't. But maybe, you know, you're a drug dealer. You can go buy your own cash counter. Um, those cash counters now, they actually scan the serial number of every bill. Uh, and they keep a database of every serial number of every bill that they scan, even when they're going by, like, you know, 130 seconds. Um, and guess what those cash counters are now? Yeah, they're networked, right? Um, and so this is the thing, the same thing is happening to our postal mail. The USPS in the United States, uh, they photograph addressing information for every piece of mail now that they process. And the, these are just the challenges that we face, right? They, they see it as metadata. Like maybe they don't know what you spent that money on, uh, but they know that that cash was deposited by this person at this bank, eventually this business. And the last time that the system writ large saw this bill was over in this state or that, and it was withdrawn by this person at that time. Um, and we have no idea how the federal government uh, is using these programs. We have no idea how the banks are using these programs to perform uh, sort of surveillance and link analysis of how sort of financial flows occur. But then, as you say, uh, then we get cryptocurrency. Uh, now, Cryptocurrency, and by this, I'm just going to say Bitcoin, um, is really failing comprehensively, terribly on the privacy angle. And I've said this again, and people are like, oh, tap, tap, look at what Taproot actually does. Taproot does not fix Bitcoin's privacy problem. And there's some arguments that it makes it worse by this sort of fragmented address space, making uh, a forensic sort of flow analysis easier because you can use this kind of wallet, is using an ancient address. They sent, um, a payment to this new person with a new form of address, right? But the change address went back to the old one. So even though there's one input, two outputs, uh, you can tell one was a payment and one was a sort of a refund or a change of it. Shouldn't be like that. Uh, there's no reason for it to happen. We see so many different privacy clones. Uh, Zcash, uh, I have said repeatedly, uh, really does the best in this space. Um, with their uh, shielded transactions. The criticism is that like, these system transactions don't occur uh, by default, which is valid. In my opinion, they, they should happen by default. Uh, there are other uh, cryptocurrencies like Monero, a privacy company, which is having a lot of trouble being listed on exchanges broadly, uh, which has sort of privacy by default, but it's a lower measure of privacy. They're just playing a shell game. Um, and those shell games really don't last forever particularly as uh, technology does better and better. And we haven't seen legal request in the kind of way that, that we want to see it done. Um, but they're both great projects. And there are many, many other uh, privacy coins out there. But like you said, we see exchanges starting to go privacy. That's scary. Um, the way that you fix this, the way that you normalize this is you make Bitcoin private, right? And I mean, the main chain, I'm not talking about putting a layer two. I'm not saying lightning chain against, right? Uh, you have to make, the idea cryptocurrency is private by design. 
Uh, and once you normalize that, it's fait accompli. And it's really frustrating, I think, for a lot of people in the space that the core development team for Bitcoin has not prioritized this because the longer they wait, the uh, more obstacles are going to be put in place to prevent that from um, being the case. Right now, you, Bitcoin really can't be list, delisted uh, by exchanges. Um, and the, the sooner we take advantage of that, the better off we will be. Yeah, and one of the things that I find so frustrating about working on policy around financial surveillance is that somehow everyone seems to just accept that the financial surveillance of the traditional banking system is totally normal, that it's necessary that banks turn over financial records yeah. to the government by default and mass. And this was never the norm historically. A lot of this flew out of like September 11th with like counterterrorism financing and you know, like counterterrorism financing at, at like Bank of America. Like we want terrorists to be sending financial flows over Bank of America because then we know what they're doing. We know who it's going to. We can knock on their door and like we can blow up their, 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 their house. Right. Uh, the way we, we deal with these things is, 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 is really crazy because we structured these new policies and then panic. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump in there. Uh, but I just, I think it's important. Actually, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. When did these things just start to change from this old paradigm things were in terms of what the government could get from banks and what they can get in the government? So, you know, back, uh, one of the original cases um, around uh, this type of financial surveillance was the Miller case back in the 1970s, where the Supreme Court looked at bank records under the Bank Secrecy Act, because this is all happening under the Bank Secrecy Act, and the way that that was being collected and said, well, look, since you're giving the, a third party, the bank, your financial data, um, they can turn that over. You don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in that. Um, so because you don't the, own it, the bank owns it. Right? <laughs> it's no longer your record; it's the bank's record. So the, the government doesn't need a warrant or anything like that because the bank can voluntarily provide it. That's what you're saying, right? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Because you've shown it to the bank, suddenly you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in it. And of course, in the 1970s, you can understand where the third party doctrine came from because the amount of information that you were showing to someone. Was, was, I mean, minimal, right? Like the checks you're writing. <laughs> Your library card. Right, exactly, exactly. And then you fast forward to today. And, you know, the, I, I actually think that if you brought this to the Supreme Court again, um, it, this would come out very differently because we've seen in the last few years, the Supreme Court chipping away at the third party doctrine and recognizing that uh, if you, it, the today, if you have state, you know, if you have someone's financial records, the things that they're showing to third parties, it's a comprehensive picture of absolutely everything that they do, right? Um, their their whole lives, and so I think this would turn out differently if it went up to the court today. But the thing that I find so so weird here is that even cryptocurrency advocates will will say you know, in responding to proposed regulations, things like, you know, as long as you're just regulating cryptocurrency the same way as you're regulating traditional financial uh, institutions, you know, as long as the information that's being handed over about crypto transactions is the same, then that's okay. We're not gonna, we don't, you know, these are like well-known cryptocurrency advocates. And it's like, there's this stigma that if you support allowing financial transactions to be anonymous you support money laundering and terrorism you know yeah i mean i i think it's strategic um i, I think if you ask a lot of these people privately uh, they would all say they hate it um they would all say it's insane they would all say they don't do it um but at the same time i think a lot of these guys uh are not comfortable being first to break cover um and they're afraid of regulation right uh the 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 Problem with the cryptocurrency space at uh, the largest scale today uh, is the people who make these decisions have the biggest stake in the system. And the system has benefited from the fact that it has not been regulated out 
existence, or you know, there's no attempt to regulate that existence. Currently, uh, by the structures is this today, and so they have become fantastically wealthy. Uh, and this puts a lot on the line, right? I'm, I'm not saying they have no principles. I'm not saying you know, anything like that. I'm saying they realize how much value there is both for themselves and for everybody else who's bought into these systems uh, by not rocking them. And it's important to remember uh, that <laughs> sometimes the boat can be bigger than the puddle. Uh, and right now, they're all afraid of being, you know, capsized and drowned in the ocean. Um, but there is uh, like right now they're in a puddle and <laughs> there's a rainstorm out there and the puddle's getting bigger uh, and I, I think they need to understand that it's important to establish these things before the idea that kyc kyc everywhere for everything you know we move these uh you take something off the exchange and the exchange says well you need to identify who owns that wallet uh, and you need to identify uh where this came from you need to identify you know where you got these funds from because, you know, again, like Bank of America can do this to, to somebody, and they have done this since September 11th. Well, September 11th is not the precedent. That's not the world that we want to live in until the end of time. That's not going to change unless somebody makes a change. The idea of the Bitcoin protocol, the peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, is the idea that we can send these payments to anyone permissionlessly. And this is true if it's in your wallet. But how do people fill their wallets? Do they get it through exchanges? And these guys are uh, imposing permissioning steps that are intermediary to the transaction. And the only way to defeat that uh, is to allow some kind of purification step, right? Where we remove all of the taint, we remove all of the identification, we remove all of the cruft being imposed at this external level uh, this external layer in the system and return it to this idea uh, that we can have direct trade, we can have direct commerce, we can have direct interaction, anyone, anywhere, anytime. Until we recognize that and, and realize that and enforce that uh, by, or at least provide opportunity through the protocol level, um, crypto hasn't gotten to where it needs to be. Yeah, and and you know there are all these governments today um, that I'd I'd like to get your thoughts on uh, central bank digital currencies. Um, I personally it's terrible. Yeah, but go on. <laughs> right, exactly. I personally find this terrifying. Right, like, it's completely terrifying. It reminds me of these photos from the Hong Kong protests where there are these huge lines at the subway station, and people want to pay for tickets in cash because. No one wants their electronic purchases to place them at the scene of the protest, which to me really underscores that a cashless society is a surveillance society. So the last thing I want is for all money to be digitally administered by a government. And, and so what are your thoughts on, on CBDCs? Yeah, I mean, there's so many problems that like, even if we step away from privacy, uh, we know China is trying out their digital yen. And um, the idea, what the, the hot, exciting idea that was being uh, written about in like Bloomberg on this is that they could issue money that has an expiration date because it's digitally provided, right? They can set the rules on this. They uh, own the wallets. They distribute this. They, the tokens they create, they can script however they want. And so they go, well, for economic stimulus, you know, we can give a payment. And if you don't use it, you lose it. Uh, but... <laughs> Simply the idea that anyone anywhere can revoke your money is terrifying. How can anyone say, you know, we're all, we're all going back to gold at that point, like digging in the ground and like burying acorns in the forest like squirrels. Um, and, you know, there, there's actually an argument to be made for people doing that uh, for thousands of years. That's why sometimes you find caches of like, uh, you know, buried coins under something else in England. Um, it's because people recognize for good reason you have to be able to store value somehow uh, that can't be confiscated uh, because confiscation is not always just, even if it is legal. Um, and just to respond a little bit to the, the Hong Kong thing, I think that's a great point, but it also shows where uh, we are really bad at uh, anticipating threats and we're very bad at scaling things. You go to the subway, 
um, and you don't want to use cash uh, because you don't want your ticket to be associated with your card that says you went to this protest at that time. Great, makes sense, good idea. Um, at the same time, you're carrying your phone, and there are cell phone towers at the protest site because there's cell phone towers everywhere in the city, and your phone is associated with your SIM card. Your SIM card is associated with the telecommunications company. The telecommunications company associates that with your payment information. Uh, the phone company still knows you are at that protest site because your phone is at the protest site. Um, and the, you know, the telecommunications company has all of your billing information. They probably have your address and information and they provide this to the government. In every country, I don't care where you are, uh, telecommunications companies uh, are some of the most regulated entities on the planet. They are always subordinate uh, to the government uh, and entirely dependent on the government for permission to operate their business. And that means they're basically the least reliable partners you can have in protecting yourself, uh, probably only second to banks. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is this is really the problem. How do we make sure that someone can ride this up? How do we make sure that someone can that communicate freely? How do we make sure that someone uh, can public freely and also maybe private? Uh, because you can't, and you can't spend, free, uh, and you can't associate freely or do anything freely unless you can do it privately in many circumstances, right? And what are those circumstances? Uh, people are like, you know, privacy, privacy, privacy. Uh, and I don't think this is true in this this conference that like people poo poo it. Uh, but when, you know, you get these um, sort of walking corpses that are on the op ed boards of major newspapers around the world. Uh, and they they dismiss this again because they're bought into the system. Um, they don't realize the value of rights because they need their rights. When you are established, when you are in the majority, when you are representative of especially the powerful segments of society, uh, you don't need the rights because the rights aren't protecting you against anything. Um, you are in the position where you impose your influence on others rather than being influenced, uh, yourself so much. And when you have majoritarian positions, when you have majoritarian leanings, um, you know, not, none of this really benefits you. Uh, let me cut, cut this short here, but the, the point is privacy protects uh, the minority against the majority. It's the people who are different. It's the people who are interested in different things, who think different things, who say different things, who buy different things. Um, they are the ones that need the protections of those rights, because they're doing something uh, that is fundamentally uh, different than what the system was presumed, uh, or, or, or the presumption that the system presumed people would be operating under when it was created. Uh, but that's where progress comes from. If we go, well, the system as it is today is great, you know, and which we know it's not, but if we assume it is, uh, and we go, nobody should do anything different. We want to put all these laws in place to make sure nobody does anything different. Great. Maybe you, you will be able to perfectly enforce every law everywhere all the time. Think about how horrible that would be. Uh, think about all the times in history where the law was wrong and the only just thing to do was to break it. Uh, this is the kind of thing that I, I think people in Hong Kong will recognize. And sadly, if we don't get critical mass, you know, we could end up like that. So with our remaining five minutes, I'd like to talk a little about how we don't end up like that. And so for the people in the audience who are building the decentralized web, I would love to hear what you think is the most important for them to keep in mind for their projects and, and really to hear in these last five minutes your vision of the decentralized web. The first thing, and I think the most important thing, a lot of people forget right now, is getting rich and doing something great are distinct goals. Um, a lot of people have in mind that they can do both at the same time. And sometimes, quite frequently in this space recently, it has been possible, right? Uh, but I don't think you should plan for that. I think uh, getting rich is is not uh, the goal here. And if it is, um, cool, you know, do whatever, have fun with your project. But that's not really what it means. Um, what we need are the new capabilities that are worth attention, that are designed um, to work regardless of whether people are bought in or bought out the system. Um, right now, you know, people are all, it, it's like 
bag holders and dumpers and the, you know, everything has become so financialized. That's a distractor. Um, even when my, my own circumstances, right? I just did an auction uh, for an NFT uh, for the benefit of the Freedom of the Press Foundation. I didn't make a dollar off of this. Everything went to the Press Foundation. Um, so I think it's a worthy cause. I said, we're there. And just to be clear, I don't take a salary. I've never made any money from, from dealing with that. Yeah. Um, uh, but thanks to enormous support from people out there all over the world who, you know, I've never heard of before, uh, it sold for over $5 million. Um, and, and that's, you know, that covers the FPS annual budget. Uh, and everybody's like, oh, all this money, it's incredible. And like, it's great. People, FAF, I've never seen so excited. But for me, NFTs, like I'm, I'm not a wild fan of them, but when I did this auction, what really interested me uh, was the way that the smart contracts worked and the idea that somebody like me who has like I judgments from the government against the Eastern District of Virginia, which is a federal court, um, nobody could get in the middle, right? Um, this could be listed. There could be people bidding for the world. It could go, you know, out of this wallet and into this wallet and like it's signed and intermediated. We start to have this idea of permissionless contracting that doesn't like I keep talking about permission, the simplify it because I know we're running out of time. The most important part of the space is that it allows us to recapture some liberty that has been lost in these last 50 years, like you mentioned. I mean, you're talking about the bank secrecy. The fact that banks are secret, 1970s, that's not that long ago. Uh, federal warrants, uh, you know, getting all these records and from Facebook and Google and all this mass surveillance stuff, telecommunications company, well, back to like the 1950s, 1960s, the only thing warrants could allow them to seize were the fruits and instrumentalities of crimes. That's the ill-gotten goods, right? And like the smoking gun, not records and these other things. Um, liberty is freedom from permission. It's being able to act without having to ask someone, is this okay? Without having somebody to like pass a law or a regulation to say, you can do this, right? Just go, nobody said this is explicitly forbidden, therefore we can do it, just to, to act freely. Um, and this, I think, is what this is allowing us to do. As you said, uh, the internet already allows us to do tremendous things, but it's being exploited, it's being controlled. And the financial aspect is where a lot of this control is entering through. If we can permit people to act without permission and privately in this space, which I, I think is like privacy coins, all coins need to be private or they are failing. This is my position. Um, because you cannot divorce um, free trade from private trade. Uh, the minute you make uh, free trade, a sort of public trade, uh, you get judgments from all of these different institutions. You know, you get taint histories and all of these analyses, uh, and that's problematic. There are other ways that we can investigate financial fraud, uh, financial misconduct, terrorism financing, and these other things that we've done throughout history before these networks existed. Uh, we should not compromise ourselves uh, for the benefit of known bad actors. And again, it's not just your government. Don't worry about the United States government, Canadian government, or whatever. You got to worry about all of them. They got courts in North Korea, right? They can stamp a warrant too. They've got them in China. They've got them in Russia. They've got them, whoever you don't like, they're all over the place. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Well, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to get to chat with you and really, really appreciate hearing your thoughts. It's been an honor. Thank you so much for having me.